When I moved abroad, I couldn't call my mom, so I convinced her to download WhatsApp so we could message each other whenever we wanted. She didn't know technology very well, so I had to help her set everything up before I left. I had to explain things over and over before she felt comfortable. Then I flew to my new place in Italy and sent mom a text that I had arrived. She responded with a heart emoji. After that, mom and I messaged each other pretty constantly. It was weird, but even though we were on the other side of the world, I felt closer to her than ever. We talked more on WhatsApp than we ever had when we were living in the same town. I told her all about my new job and my new house, and she filled me in on all the crazy things going on back home. She told me about her karaoke night and the date she went on and her new yoga class. She sounded like a completely different person. I guess she was waiting for me to finally move out of the house before she started having a social life of her own. I was so proud of her. About three weeks after I'd moved, mom sent me a really strange message. Do you know someone named Joe? It was a really common name, but I couldn't think of any specific Joes that I was close with, so I told her no. She explained that she'd made a new friend on WhatsApp named Joe who said that he was one of my college friends. She said he seemed really nice. My heart sank. She was being scammed. I asked her if she had a photo of this person and she sent me a photo of a very handsome blonde man. I'd never seen him before. I instantly did a reverse image search on Google and sure enough, the photo was made by AI. Joe was not a real person. I tried to call mom to explain everything directly, but she didn't answer. She texted me that she didn't know how to receive calls on WhatsApp, even though I'd already shown her how. So I was just stuck to texting. I told her that Joe was a scammer and she should block him. Her response was, I don't know how to block people, and I don't think he's a scammer, he seems so nice. My mom is an amazing person but I'd always been worried that she'd fall for some internet scam. She was too trusting, and her lack of computer skills made her particularly vulnerable. I kept trying to warn her about Joe, but she wouldn't listen. I eventually gave up and messaged my cousins, asking them to visit mom and talk some sense into her. They said they would, but then I never heard anything back. The next day, mom messaged me again. She said that Joe had asked her for some money to help with his hospital bills. Again, I told her to stop talking with him, but she said it was too late. She already sent him $2,000. I can't tell you how frustrated I was. I called up my uncle, who also lived in my hometown, and told him the situation. He said he'd go over and talk to her. He called me back an hour later saying that mom denied everything, pretending that she had no idea what he was talking about. There was nothing I could do to save mom from this scammer. She wouldn't listen to me, and she denied everything to my uncle's face. I just hoped that the guy would leave her alone now that he got his money. Unfortunately, that wasn't what happened. Mom messaged me in the middle of the night saying that she was going to visit Joe at the hospital to see if he was okay after his operation. Don't go, I wrote in all caps. She didn't respond after that. Then an hour later, after I'd gone back to sleep, she messaged me again. He wasn't at the hospital. She added a sad face emoji. Because he's not real, I told her. I hoped that this would finally make her come to her senses, but she responded back. No, I just messaged him. He said the doctors let him out early. I was so frustrated that I turned off my phone. If mom was going to allow herself to keep getting scammed, then I was just going to stay out of it. Nothing I could say would make her change her mind. I didn't hear from her for the next few days. I was worried, but I asked my cousins to check in on her. They said that mom was fine. She was at home watching TV. That made me feel at least a little better. The next night, mom finally messaged me again. I haven't heard from you. Is everything okay? I told her I was fine. I didn't mention Joe. Then she wrote, Good. I'm finally meeting Joe tomorrow. I'll take photos when I see him to prove that he's real. I told her not to go. I begged her. I wrote a long emotional message explaining how much she meant to me and how she was putting herself in danger. She didn't respond.
The next day was the start of my one week vacation from my new job. There was some kind of festival in Italy and I planned to spend the week exploring my new town. But with my mom acting so crazy, I knew I had to fly back there and finally sort everything out. I got the first available flight, which was surprisingly cheap because it was so last minute, and I flew all the way back to America. The entire flight I was furious that I had to sacrifice my own vacation to save my mother from her own stupidity. The plane landed in the afternoon and I texted my mom to see where she was. She sent me an address. Is this where you're meeting Joe? I asked. Yep, she wrote back. Already here. I'm just waiting for him. Go home, I wrote. She didn't respond. I ordered an Uber and gave him the address. We drove for half an hour until we ended up at an old warehouse on the edge of the city. It looked like the sketchiest place ever. I asked the Uber driver to wait there and then I ran out of the car to look for mom. I saw a black truck parked in the back, but I didn't see mom's car. I messaged her, asking if she was still there. I instantly got a reply. I have your mother. If you give me $10,000, I'll let her go. My heart was racing. I didn't see anyone outside, so I had to go into the warehouse. I took a deep breath and ran in. A man was waiting for me. Right on time he said and grabbed me. As he held me down, three other men came out of the shadows and took my phone and wallet. I demanded to know where my mom was. The man laughed. How am I supposed to know? You've been talking to me the whole time. I didn't understand at first, and then as the men started to tie me up, I realized what a mistake I'd made. All along, the WhatsApp messages weren't coming from my mom. They'd all been from a scammer posing as my mom and somehow using her number. I thought that she was being scammed, but it was actually me. I felt so stupid, and now I had no idea what they were going to do to me. The Uber driver honked his horn outside. All the men froze. You brought someone with you? Yes, I said. If you don't let me go, he'll stop you. One of the men looked through the dusty warehouse window and said, Looks like the guy's driving away. I felt like screaming, but I couldn't. They'd shoved a dirty rag into my mouth. They kept me tied up, stole everything I had, and used my phone to drain my bank account. Then they chloroformed me. When I woke up, I was no longer tied up. All my stuff was gone. I walked back to the road and hitchhiked all the way back to my mom's place. She was shocked to see me. I told her what happened and she said, See? That's why I didn't want to use WhatsApp. Too many scammers. Summer had just begun. The two people I lived with at the time were total outdoor nuts. In the summer, they would spend every weekend camping, hiking, paddleboarding, mountain biking and more name an outdoor activity and they've at least tried it. After trudging through a rainy spring, finally, a weekend forecast came that called for sunny skies and warm weather. They were over the moon excited. For days, they talked about all the potential things they could do. How would they start summer? They wanted to kick it off right, so they decided to go on a camping trip on a lake so they could paddleboard. I was happy for them because they were so excited. I won't lie though, I dreaded being left alone for the weekend. A few months prior to this incident, I had a nasty breakup. We had been together for three years and I caught her cheating on me with her guy best friend, who she claimed I had nothing to worry about. That's always how these things turn out, don't they? In the summer, we used to go on hikes together, lounge at the pool and go on small weekend getaways, but now I didn't know what I would do with my time. Usually, when summer rolled around, I was excited to get outside. This year, I was apprehensive. I didn't have anyone to really do anything with. I could tag along with my roommates, but I could never keep up with them, which resulted in them hiding their frustration from me. This year, I was going to be hiding inside, playing video games with the blinds closed. When my roommates asked what I was going to do while they were gone, I was honest. They felt bad. One of them chimed in that my ex was a nasty lying skank and I was better without her. I agreed. 
They suggested I try and put myself out there. One told me to just jump on the dating apps and have some fun. The other recommended I join a club or something to try and meet people with similar interests. Both options were good, but I had no clue how to find good clubs, so I went with the dating apps. Before my roommates left, they helped me build a profile. They chose my pictures and we brainstormed a bio together. We decided to go with just looking to meet some new people and have some fun, winky face. My roommates left early the next morning before I woke up. I spent the day passing time. I played video games, made an elaborate sandwich for lunch, walked my roommate's dog, and played more video games. I was bored out of my mind, and the idea of texting my ex crept into my mind. I heard she and her friend didn't work out. She had tried to contact me a month ago, but I ignored her. I shook my head. I couldn't do that. I couldn't go back to a cheater. I paused my game and pulled out my phone to open Tinder. I started swiping through. To my pleasant surprise, there were a lot of girls who were my type popping up. It felt like I was swiping right on every girl, but still, I had no matches. After swiping for 15 minutes with no matches, I gave up. I threw my phone to the side and resumed my game. Right as I hit play on the game, my phone lit up. You have a match, my phone screen read. Then another notification popped up. New message. I paused my game again and grabbed my phone. I matched with a girl named Sasha, which is a hot girl name. I looked through her pictures and Sasha was, in fact, a hot girl. She was way out of my league. She had long blonde wavy hair and stunning blue eyes. Her message was, hi. My heart pounded in my chest. I couldn't believe a girl like Sasha was seriously talking to me. I started brainstorming a response. I needed something flirty, confident, and something that would start a conversation. I prayed we would have fun banter. I looked at her bio, but it was empty, so I was on my own with coming up with something clever. After 10 minutes, I had nothing, so I simply responded, Hey there, what are you up to? My plan was to try to hang out with her that night. She responded immediately, I'm not up to much, why? Do you have any ideas of something we could do? My heart fluttered. She wanted to do something with me too. I invited her over after dinner for a movie and hopefully more. Sasha was ecstatic and agreed. I looked around and the place was trashed. I got to cleaning right away so Sasha wouldn't be grossed out. I ate a light dinner and showered about an hour before she said she would come over. I didn't want anything to hurt my chances of being with her. Rushing around, I realized I was finally happy. This was the most excitement I've had in months. Right as the clock struck 9 o'clock, there was a knock at the door. My heart started to thud against my chest. I opened the door to reveal a petite girl with short jet black hair. Sasha was blonde and curvy, and the girl before me was, respectfully, a bored. There was no way the two were the same. Um, hello? I said. Hi, the girl said with a big smile. Brandon, right? I'm Sasha. She reached her hand out to shake mine. I wondered if it would be rude to say she looked different from her pictures, but I decided to wait for the right moment. Right, uh, I'm happy to meet you in person. I tried to appear excited and invited her in. Can I get you something to drink? I have water, beer, or wine. Hmm, I'm more of a cocktail girl. Any chance you have something harder and some mixer? No, sorry, just beer and wine, I responded. Sasha opted for wine. Oh my goodness, you know my sister. My heart dropped. She was looking at the one picture of my ex I left up. Brit? I asked. Sasha smiled big and nodded. Um, yeah, I responded hesitantly. How do you know her? You're never going to believe this, she started explaining as I prepared our drinks. I gave her a cup of wine. She's my sister. We're not very close, but I still thought I knew who her friends were. I could feel all the color wash out of my face. Britt mentioned she had a sister, but I couldn't quite remember what she told me about her. She had been sent away for some reason. 
getting with her sister would be good revenge, I thought. No way, I acted interested. Yeah, she's friends with my roommate, I lied. Sasha's smile widened. I wanted the subject to change. Want to watch a movie? She nodded. Okay, just let me run to the bathroom, but you can start looking through and see if anything stands out. I'm game for anything. I left her on the couch with our drinks on the coffee table. In the bathroom, I brushed my teeth just in case. I wanted to be as fresh as possible. She wasn't the Victoria's Secret model she pretended to be, but I did like the idea of getting revenge on Brit. I tried to remember what Brit told me about her sister. Brit's sister was significantly younger than her, but Sasha looked at least 20. Brit was 25. I remembered the gap being bigger than that. I came out and Sasha had made herself comfortable. How about something scary? She offered. I agreed and she started playing one of the Conjuring movies. I'm not sure which. My mind was busy trying to remember how old this girl was. She had already lied about what she looked like, so I wasn't sure if she would be honest about her age. How old are you again? Uh, I forgot what your profile listed. 22, she responded. I knew that was a lie. I smiled and nodded. Okay, just making sure. You can never be too safe. My buddy got in some trouble because he got with a girl who lied about her age. I can't even imagine. She acted like that was the most horrible thing she had ever heard. We turned our attention to the movie. It was hard to pay attention because I kept trying to remember what Britt had said about her sister. She said she was crazy. I didn't know if I wanted to hook up with her anymore because Sasha had already lied to me so much. As the movie played, Sasha got closer and closer. When something would pop out, she would bury her head in my chest. I put my arm around her to play along, but alarm bells were going off in my head. When the family cat died in the movie, everything Britt told me about her sister came rushing back in. I only met her sister once three years ago when she was 14, so she was 17. My heart started to race with anxiety. Britt told me they had to send her away because she kept killing their family pets. Her parents finally intervened when she operated on a cat she was babysitting. She sliced the boy's arm open and played with his veins. The boy ended up having nerve damage and didn't have full use of his hand anymore. Afterward, Britt said her sister told her that she wanted to see human bones still in the body. I felt like I was going to hurl. Her sister, in that first meeting, clung to me. She wouldn't leave me alone. At the time, I thought it was cute that she must have had a crush on me. Britt didn't act like it was cute. Britt acted disturbed. She told me after that her sister wasn't normal and never had romantic feelings for someone. I wasn't sure what that meant. I stopped the movie. I turned to her. You know, I'm really tired. I'm sorry to cut this short, but I think you should leave. Her once bright eyes turned dark. What? Do you not like me or something? No, that's not it. I'm, I'm just tired. You seem fine to me. She scooted back from me, but didn't appear like she was going to leave. Okay, I lied to you. I figured honesty is the best. I used to date your sister. We were together for three years. At first, I thought it would be okay. Your sister has no interest in me, but I can't shake the feeling that this is wrong. It's not wrong, she said, seeming unfazed by my revelation. I know you used to date Brit. I remember you. Then why did you act like you didn't? I asked with some anger in my voice. I didn't want to scare you away. I've had a crush on you for a long time, she said with a mischievous smile. Not a seductive mischievous, though. Her smile was something malevolent. Sasha stood up and started to survey the apartment again. She ran her finger over my roommate's trinkets and books. You're also 17. I'm gonna be 18 in a couple months. I won't tell anyone. She tried to appear innocent. I shook my head. I would like you to leave now. I headed towards the door. From behind me, I heard her grunt and rush towards me. 
I turned to see that she had picked up a heavy crystal that belonged to my roommate, and she was running towards me. I stepped to the side, and she ran into the door. She had too much momentum to stop. Sasha must have hit her head when she collapsed on the floor because she looked like she had passed out. I checked, and she was still breathing. I called Britt to come get her. When Britt arrived, she was panicked. Are you okay? Did she do anything to you? My heart felt warm that she was so concerned for me. I explained to Britt that her sister catfished me, and when I remembered everything she told me, I asked her to leave. Britt shook her head and I held her heart. She told me that one of the reasons her parents ended up sending her away was because Britt read in her sister's journal how she wanted to cut open my neck. My neck? I asked. Britt nodded. In her journal, she talked about how she would like to explore under the skin. She wanted to see your jugular. Yours specifically. I felt sick. After Britt took her sister and left, I sat on the couch and finished my beer. About halfway through the beer, the room started spinning, and I had to lie down. I passed out and woke up the next morning. Sasha must have put something in my beer when I was in the bathroom. If I had drunk more, she probably would have fun exploring under my skin. I never used a dating app again. I can just meet people the old-fashioned way. My husband Tony and I were spending Saturday night at home. It was just a normal evening. I figured we'd watch some Netflix and eat leftovers. We were sitting and talking in our living room. I don't remember what we were talking about. Halfway through our conversation, Tony's cell phone rang. He answered it. Whoever was on the other line talked to him for a while, and he listened in silence. Then he said one word. Okay. Without acknowledging me, he put on his shoes and rushed out of the house. I assumed he'd come back and explain what was going on, but he never did. I waited on the couch for about 30 minutes before I tried to call him. He didn't answer. After an hour, I was extremely confused and scared. In all our years of marriage, Tony had never done anything like this before. I eventually called 911 and explained what happened to my husband. The dispatcher listened to my story and told me that there was nothing that she could do. She told me to wait at the house until he returned. If he wasn't back by morning, I should call again. I tried to calm myself down. There needed to be a simple explanation for why Tony would just run off. Still, I couldn't stop myself from worrying. I tried to go to sleep, but I couldn't. In the middle of the night, my phone rang. I quickly grabbed it and saw that it was Tony. I was instantly filled with relief. I answered, but the voice on the other end wasn't Tony's. It was a man's voice, but it sounded fake, like the caller was using some voice modifier. Do you want to see your husband again? The man asked. Who is this? The man didn't answer. Instead, he gave me directions. He said that Tony was in the woods behind our house. He explained that Tony was safe but that I needed to come find him. He told me exactly where to look. I tried once again to ask him who he was, but the man just said, Be quick. You have 20 minutes. And do not get the police involved. Then he hung up. I rushed out of the house and followed the man's directions through the dark, twisted trees. I wasn't thinking straight, and I didn't even bring my phone with me. I'm always terrible under pressure and I'd never felt more pressured than during that night. I ran through the darkness, looking around to see if anyone was hiding behind the trees. Everything was extremely quiet. Eventually, I saw a clearing up ahead. This is where the man told me to go. I was about to step into the clearing when my foot sank into the ground. I stepped on a tarp covered in dead grass. I bent down and realized that someone had dug a very deep hole in the ground and covered it up with a tarp. This was obviously a trap. Whoever had drawn me here wanted me to fall into it. I stepped back, careful not to get too close to the hole, and I hid behind a tree. This was the moment I realized that I didn't bring my phone with me. I looked all around, but everything was silent and still. For a long moment, I didn't know what to do. 
I saw a large rock next to me. I grabbed the rock and threw it. It landed in the center of the tarp and then sank into the hole with a loud thud. Then I screamed out in fake pain. I waited. Slowly someone stepped out of the darkness. It was Tony. He must have dug the hole. He must have planned this whole thing. But why? It didn't make sense. Tony stood on the edge, looking for me at the bottom of the hole. Obviously, he didn't see anything. I jumped out of my hiding place and shoved him from behind. He gasped in surprise and then fell in. I heard a horrible snap as he landed. I think he broke his leg. Then I stood on the edge and looked down on him. What are you trying to do? I asked him. Tony started to cry. We were married for six years and I'd never seen him cry before. It was awful. He didn't even wipe his face. He just let the tears fall. He said that he wasn't his idea. Someone was making him do this. And if I didn't let him out, he'd be killed. I was so angry and confused to believe anything that he said. I demanded that he tell me everything, but he just cried harder and begged me to pull him free. He said he would explain everything once we were safe inside the house. Looking back, I know I should have done what he said, but I just couldn't. I lost all my trust in him. I ran back home, leaving him in the hole. Once I ran inside, I called the police. An officer arrived pretty quickly and took back into the forest where Tony was. But when I got there, the hole was empty. Tony was gone. It's been three weeks now, and I still don't know what happened to my husband. The police spent days looking around the forest, but aside from the hole, they couldn't find any traces of my husband. I logged on to Tony's computer to see if there was some explanation. I looked through his recent emails, but I couldn't find anything. Then I checked his private bank account and saw that someone had transferred thousands of dollars into his account on the day before he disappeared. That only left more questions. Who had paid him? And worst of all, would this person come back for me? I want to think that Tony's still out there somewhere, lying low until it's safe for him to come back to me. But deep down, I know he's gone forever.